Are you working for a distributor? Or maybe you're in the distilled spirits manufacturing game, and now you're looking to expand your spirits business industry knowledge in order to work better with other distilling companies. Well, if you want to leg up on the competition, you need to take a look at the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. This is a six-course online program, and it's going to prepare you for everything on the business side of the spirits industry, things like marketing, finance, and operations. And it's also 100% online, so you can access the courses at any time and anywhere. So go to uofl.me slash bourbonpursuit to learn more. Catoctin Creek is a proud supporter of Bourbon Pursuit. At Catoctin Creek, they pride themselves on making traditional rye whiskey as it would have been made in the 1800s. Virginia grain, Virginia water, Virginia barrels. Catoctin Creek, the Virginia rye whiskey. This is brought to you by Smooth Ambler, a proud member of the Bourbon Pursuit family. Smooth Ambler builds on the traditional roots of American whiskey through innovative blends, proudly sourced whiskeys, and a unique line of their own homemade bourbon and rye recipes made in West Virginia. So venture off the traditional trail and go see them in Maxwellton, West Virginia. They'd love to welcome you to the family that they're building around their whiskey. Are people going to continue saying, oh, it's just our rye whiskey? Or are they going to start labeling it and saying, this is Indiana rye whiskey? I'm surprised it's 51% rye. I thought it'd be 94% or higher. (laughs) (laughs) This is episode 303 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's episode, on the 56th Bourbon Community Roundtable, here's your weekly bourbon news update. Jeff Arnett, the former master distiller of Jack Daniels and our guest back on episode 150, has announced he is now the co-founder of Tennessee's newest distillery called Company Distilling and it's set to open in the fall of 2021 in the Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee. The first company distilling location to open will be a 4,000 square foot tasting room and restaurant in Townsend, Tennessee, with aspirations to move into a 20,000 square foot refurbished building that will have a tasting room, restaurant, brewery, retail store, and entertainment more in 2022. Green River Distilling, formerly known as OZ Tyler, based out of Owensboro, Kentucky, paused briefly to celebrate the filling of its 300,000th barrel of bourbon. With each barrel holding roughly 53 gallons, that's 15.9 million gallons of bourbon. Jacob Call, the Green River's master distiller and director of operations, said it took nearly four and a half years to reach that 300,000th mark. But now with production running at 90,000 barrels per year, those milestones will start coming a lot faster. New Rift Distillery has announced it's opening a $2 million expansion that will increase its whiskey production by 50%. This will add 900 square feet to the distillery, which will add three additional fermenters. The distillery will also be able to operate six days a week instead of just four, and this will allow New Rift to produce 12,000 barrels per year, up from its current 8,000. Jim Beam is going all in on becoming green and carbon neutral, making long-term commitments to sustainability across every facet of its value chain, from seed to sip in a new program called Proof Positive. Beam is looking at nature by putting investments in efficient technology and cleaner fuels and reducing its water usage by 50% while also reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. They're also planting more trees than those harvested for making barrels and using 100% recyclable materials. They're investing in the consumer as well by putting $500 million towards promoting responsible decisions in marketing and providing nutrition information for 100% of all of its products and more investments are going to the community by reaching 50% of women in leadership within its organization. Are you looking for a different kind of bourbon tour when you're planning your next trip to Kentucky? Maybe perhaps one led by Colonel H. Taylor himself? Well, from May through October, the Frankfurt and Franklin County Tourist and Convention Commission is offering bourbon and history walking tours in historic downtown Frankfurt. You can join Colonel E.H. Taylor for a 45 to 60 minute guided walking tour in historic downtown Frankfurt. Historian Russ Kennedy portrays Colonel Taylor and will be your guide to learn more about bourbon history in the area. Tours will be offered on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1 o'clock p.m. and tickets are only $11 per person. You can reserve yours at visitfrankfurt.com. 
A 250-year-old bottle of whiskey is believed to be the oldest known whiskey in existence and set to be auctioned. The front of the old Ingledew whiskey bottle says it's from Evans and Ragland in LaGrange, Georgia. The back features a typed note to the glass that says, this bourbon was probably made prior to 1865. Skinner auctioneers say they used a needle to extract a small sample of the liquid to be sent off of testing by experts, and scientists from the University of Georgia determined that the whiskey was likely bottled between 1763 and 1803. The bourbon is set to be auctioned at the end of June and will fetch nearly twenty dollars to $40,000. Now moving on to bourbon release news. Garrison Brothers has released a new bourbon called Lahaina Mandre that has been aged for four years in traditional bourbon, then aged for another four years in imported French Limousin casks. The eight-year-old is one of their oldest releases to date, bottling at 101 proof, and the price is set at $300 each for the roughly 2,000 bottles, and they will begin for sale at the distillery starting on May 8th. Now for today's episode, we hit on some great topics for this roundtable. We discuss what does it mean to Kentucky Owl now that Dixon Deadman is leaving the brand? And there's now a new designation for Indiana Rye Whiskey, and it's going to be legal, so what's that going to entail? And now that there are 10 million barrels of whiskey aging in Kentucky, will we see an oncoming glut of bourbon in a few years? Barrel Bourbon is known for their expertise in crafting unique blends, taking lots of different whiskeys from different regions and bottling it at cask strength. And now you can even buy them online. Just visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. With that, enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from, oh, wait, me? That's right, folks. I have an original idea here. I didn't fish this one out of the many wonderful ideas that I get from folks for Above the Char who often write me on fredminnick.com or hit me up on the social medias. I am very passionate about the color of bourbon, and I wanted to talk about that for a little bit. When I first started scoring bourbon, uh, I used to give like five to ten points toward the color of bourbon, because you see, when, when bourbon goes into the barrel, it is clear as the water from your tap, and it's moving in and out of that wood every single day, extracting all that beautiful color and getting all those wonderful aromas and flavors I just love to look at the color of bourbon, whether it's a light straw or a deep, dark amber with some purple hues. And I just love looking at it, just thinking of the story of the bourbon in the barrel as it was aging. And then I kind of realized that the color of bourbon really is a moment of art. To me, That is the moment that I am most finding myself aligned with whiskey as a whole being an artistic representation of the creator. Because every whiskey has its own color and it's it's beautiful. They're all so beautiful. And I've started to realize that it is not necessarily something that I could score on. It's something that you know, 10 years ago I was scoring on, but here I am in the last five years, I've come to look at whiskey's color as art, almost like an album cover. I look at an album cover and it should get me excited to listen to the music. But let's be honest, there's some really kick-ass album covers that lead to, you know, shelf turd music and you just don't want to listen to it. It's not any good. The album designer did a much better job than the band did. (laughs) That's happened a lot of times. And then there's some albums that are just piss poor. And then you open it up and you listen to the music and you're like, holy shit, what in the world was this album designer doing? And then the album cover kind of grows on you. You know what I mean? And and that's kind of where I'm at now with bourbon is that to me, the the art of the color, the beautiness of it, just observing it, all it is is wetting my palate and giving me an expectation of what is to come. But I can't let that color of the bourbon have an influence on what I think of it. So I have completely cut out any of my you know, scoring parameters of old uh, based on color, and I focus on the aroma, the taste, 
and probably most importantly, the finish. But what will always be in my heart is that beautiful amber color with hues of purple or red or whatever it may be, because the color of bourbon is absolutely beautiful. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But that's going to do it for this week's Above the Chart. Thank you so much for allowing me to have my own idea, like the old days. But if you have an idea for Above the Chart, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. And send me your note. Until next week, cheers. Welcome, everybody. It is Bourbon Community Roundtable number 56. And part of Bourbon Pursuit, Kenny and Ryan here tonight with another great set of topics and good news and potpourri to kind of talk about. But Ryan, we haven't uh, talked in a you know a few hours. How's everything been? <laughs> been good, you know. I mean, a lot's changed since the last time I talked to you uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. about an hour ago. But uh, you're looking Ryan, good. Right, we're, we're, like an old Barry, nice. no. we're like an old Barry couple now. Oh, I know. If like 45 minutes passed without talking to Kenny. I'm like, I better call and check on him. <laughs> Make sure he made it to Stella's practice okay. Or, you know. <laughs> checking on that we got we got all kinds of business deals happening trying to trying to get barrels laid down and i I swear people that have never been in this side you you wouldn't realize how hard it is to just just get just put some whiskey in a barrel and like just leave it there for years but it's or the whiskey that's in a barrel just put on a truck and send it somewhere (laughs) it's true (laughs) true (laughs) how hard is it but anyway yes yes but we are missing fred tonight uh fred fred wasn't feeling up to uh up to part of day so we'll miss him but of course we've got the rest of the round table here so fellas welcome we'll go ahead and do our typical introduction so brian i'll leave it over to you yeah appreciate it uh happy to be on number 56 uh brian with sipping corn uh find me at bourbon justice and sipping corn and uh excited to talk about these issues it was uh, i think a surprise for a lot of people for that first topic and um it's, it's something a lot of people love to talk about so uh ready to roll Yes, we will definitely get into that one here. Jordan. Hey, this is Jordan from Breaking Bourbon, one of the three guys who runs the site. You can find us at BreakingBourbon.com and on all the socials. And uh, go to the site for the latest reviews and our up-to-date release calendar. Happy to be here and looking forward to talking about these topics. For sure. And Blake. Yep, I am uh, Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox. Always good to be here. You can find me at as always, all the socials, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, B-O-U-R-B-O-N-R, and Sealboxes, S-E-E-L-B-A-C-H-S dot com. Thanks for having me. Y'all, you have a jingle yet? You I feel like, like I should. You like, should I feel like we've heard this many episodes. Because, like, nobody knows how to spell Sealbox, and people always mess up bourbon or two, so I feel like at this point I should have come up with something um yeah that that may be in 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 the works before the next round table i think are you think, talking yeah, about yeah. like one of those bad am station jingles yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Like, nice. yeah, i'm thinking like car commercial in the 90s style um mm-hmm. that's what i'm really going for so yeah we'll see what i can come up with you can get a lot of stuff done on the internet for five dollars at fiverr.com so i was about to say i was like let's let's <laughs> see like what everybody perfect. across the world can come up with exactly oh, I'm sure you'll get some good yeah. ones by tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and let's get into it. So the big news that happened last week was Dixon Deadman announced on his Instagram that he is leaving Kentucky Owl, the brand that was owned by his family that he revived, sold to Stoli, and now it's it, he said that I think it was batch 9 or batch 10 of bourbon and then it's batch 4 of the rye will be the last batches that bear his name and signature on the label so we uh i didn't reach out to him to kind of get clarification or anything like that i figured that would be too easy uh because we wouldn't be able to talk about it and then kind of speculate but you know, I, do I, messed up. I did send him a message <laughs> <laughs> did you what do you what do you say ryan well i didn't ask for any info i just said i sent him a message that hey i know it's probably hard you know given your family's history and legacy i'm sure it's difficult to sell something off that but I'm excited for you to create your own path and your own story in this industry. I think you're qualified and I'm excited to see what's to come because, uh, you know, he, you know, to us, he was an inspiration for doing what we do. And I mean, granted he gets to work with a lot better whiskey, but, um, you know, an older whiskey, but, uh, 
no, he's an inspiration to us. You know, he's a great blender. His products are fantastic. And uh, I'm excited to see what's come. But uh, yeah, I knew, I'm sure it was hard too for him. I'm going to need, I'm going to need Ryan to do my eulogy at some point, hopefully a long <laughs> time from now, but it's all set I mean, up for you, that. You just I'll, hit I'll start it on right it now. there. Yeah. Start on it now. I want Jim Nance to do mine. I don't know. It seems like. <laughs> I think we could probably pull that off. Hello think, friends. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he also did mention that he, he's not leaving the industry. He's got a few more tricks up his sleeve. Uh, some other other projects. Now, I don't know what that means. I don't know if he has his own barrels or another brand or anything like that. I would I would venture to say that there's probably a non compete in there somewhere, and I don't know when it expires. But you know, this also kind of reminds me when I think of what happens in the tech world where there's an acquisition. Usually, there is a, a cutoff date um, to say that you know you you have to be with this company for a certain period of time until you're free to kind of go off and do whatever it is. And I'd be interested to see exactly if if that played a role into it, if he didn't see where Stoli was going or anything like that. Um, but that would just be kind of one take into it. I think that's you're exactly right, Kenny. I think when I thought of it, I thought, you know, there's probably an earnout date. He probably is fully vested now with that with that earnout, and it's time to move on. And sometimes that usually, you know, in the I've done a lot of M&A deals and that's usually how it goes too. When a founder sells something, both sides eventually say, Hey, they're not been met. Maybe it's time we part ways, you know, no hard feelings, but it's, it's very common. So for this to last forever, I think was never going to happen. And it seems like they left on good terms. So, you know, I am excited to see where he's going from there. It looks like he launched a tasting kit in class and stuff like that based on his social media presence. So it, um, I mean, cheers to him. I'm drinking batch one, the rye in his honor. Oh man, that's a good one. Fantastic, right? I mean, he put out some fantastic blends. Absolutely. So for those that are still available in the market, if you haven't had them before, they're actually worth spending the money and grabbing one or two because they're really good. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm. Uh, I mean, you know, you hate it for him because I'm sure it wasn't an easy easy decision, but um, I'm kind of excited about it. You know, I feel like we got to see a little bit of him um, after they bought out Stoli, but it it just never quite felt the same. You know, I think he was still doing all the blends and putting a ton of work into those. So it'll be interesting to see who they have do it after that. You know, they don't have many other bourbon or whiskey brands. So be interesting to see what happens with those blends now that he's gone, but I'm pretty excited to see what he does next. You know, I'd, I'd love to see, you know, episode 86, uh, where it's a co-produced blend by uh, <laughs> Kenny, and, Kenny and Ryan and Dixon. Um, no, I think it'll be good for the industry in a, as a whole, because uh, I just think he's a really smart guy, um, has a really good presence. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, so to see kind of where he goes from here, um, I think it'll be good. I'm, I'm excited to see it. What I always wonder about is, is you guys are right. You, you absolutely expect the founder to eventually part ways with whoever acquires them. It's just a matter of time. And sometimes it's right as the earnout is is done. Um, but you also got to think about creative differences. And that's what I think about. Did were they challenging him to to increase the the volume and that would uh, decrease what he thought was the quality? Was that an issue? Um, was he losing access to some of the sources? Um, you know what? There's got to be other things going on underground that uh, we may not ever know. Uh, but there's there's rest assured. There's been a lot going on there, and I'm I'm happy for him uh, to be out on his own too. I mean, he did a great job of bringing back this brand. Um, I met his grandfather years and years ago uh, at the Beaumont Inn. I had a case in Danville, and and was working with his uh, his cousin, a, a granddaughter of, of Big Daddy. And we would stop by at the Beaumont. So I've got those great men memories. And he would even then talk about the bourbon brand that the family used to have. So it's a great legacy for, for Dixon. Happy for him. He did a great job. And, uh, yeah, I don't need to know all the gory details, but I'm kind of interested. Yeah, I mean, no, we all are. Well, it is interesting <laughs> because, like, it, this whole Kentucky Owl thing, ever since Stoli acquired him, has been, like, kind of a mystery. You know, you had an amusement park that was supposed to go and they drained you know, they bought a quarry, they drained it, you know, ready for construction. Now there hadn't been construction ever. Now the lake's full again. And so it's like, uh, what is going on? Is Stoli like going to continue with Kentucky Owl or are they just going to cut it off? Like, because to me, I don't see it being without Dixon and that kind of tied to that 
family history and heritage. I, I just don't know if there's like that appeal to it anymore. But I mean, that's me that's being right. a whiskey geek, but maybe, uh, you know, a consumer that just doesn't care. They want a premium bottle and sees the high price tag and, you know, a 12 to 15 year old whiskey would doesn't care. But, you know, I feel like the bourbon community is really, I, I don't know. I feel like it's going to really ding the, the brand moving forward. Mm -hmm. I agree. That's a good question. Will you buy more bottles oh. down the road now, now that, because I, you know, I assume the, I don't know. I, I bought it because knowing that he was blending it and I trusted his taste, um, even as prices went up, all that stuff, you know, that's why I would buy a bottle. And so I, I can't foresee myself, but you know, I, I think we're probably given the, the, nerds a little too much yeah. credit here the whiskey nerds where like i, d I doubt the majority of people know what sure. it is they just see a high price yeah. they think it's automatically good and so um yeah i they, think they we know the distillers good. blake but i mean you know even when jim rutledge was at four roses i bet you 95 percent of the consumers and it's probably being pretty generous had no idea who jim rutledge was and I mean, that was as big of a name as you can get. So with Dixon, I, I highly doubt it. For anyone who's really deep into whiskey, yeah, we all know it, right? And he was the man behind the the brand. But for everyone else, you know, how many emails do you guys get where it's, I'd like to buy a gift. I want to spend X amount. It's always like a high amount. What can I buy? And you're always right. like, well, you, can, you can spend less and get a really nice gift too. But those people just want to spend money. So it's like, oh, I'm going to get a Kentucky Owl. Okay, sure. Yeah, I've got a few thoughts on that too, because I know that, that price has always been one of these things that we have talked about is kind of played Kentucky out for a long time. When the first batches came out, I mean, I remember going into Liquor Barn and seeing Kentucky Owl batch one and the glass cabinet, and they were like, hey, they've, this just came out. Like, what do you think? You want to, I mean, I think it was like $100, $150. No, like 150, dollars, 160, 150 think, yeah. something like that. And I was like, for and some. That was a, a lot. Back then. Yeah, I mean, like, this, yeah, was, this was, what, 2014 time yeah. frame, 2013? And I was just like, ah, I don't, I can't spend $150 on something I've never even known about. And, you know, fast forward a few years, I don't know what happened in the secondary market or anything like that. But, you know, it it, it went off. It took off like a rocket ship. It was, it was the original Dogecoin, if you will. And <laughs> it just, I mean, for some reason, it, it just kept going up. Now, I don't know if this was a a play in the market where they continually just kept pushing the prices. Cause what's it up to like 300, 350 now for the regular batches that come out. I mean, yeah. it's right I mean, yeah, and the confiscated is like right at a hundred, 120 or something. Yeah. And, and so when you think about it, like that's, that's pushing it. I mean, that's pushing it for a lot of consumers. Now, is it, it, it might've been a play where you look at it and say, well, yeah, like we are going to elevate ourselves to, super uber ultra premium because we don't have a lot of stock we're not meant to be an everyday on the shelf item like this is going to be when you want to spend two to three or four hundred dollars on a bottle you'll get kentucky owl now i don't know how many people would agree with that strategy i think that's a hard one and i also don't know if stoli's involvement really kind of push it that way we don't really know the ins and outs of the the, the business plan of where they plan on taking Kentucky out from a retail strategy or from a market penetration strategy or anything like that. So it's a little, like I said, for me, it's, it's kind of a turnoff almost like you wanted to kind of look at it and think like it, this could have been really good. Like this could have been big. It could have been much more widespread, but I also think at, at, at what Dixon was trying to do. I mean, and don't get me wrong. I loved every single thing that Stoli ever sent us for reviewing. And I mean, I remember when batch nine came to us and we tried it, and we were like, oh, $300. And we taste it. We're like, oh, shit, this is actually really good. <laughs> yeah. Like you wanted to hate it, but you're like, damn, this is actually really, really good. Um, but just the the pricing strategy just seemed always a little off to me. And again, I don't know who was pushing that one, but that's one that that kind of uh, really stuck out for me. Yeah. I mean, you it's know, you probably see people like Willett and, you know, sometimes Heaven Hill charging that. And you're like, well. We got 16, 17 year old whiskey. Why can't we do it too? You know, and there's not much out there. So, you know, and if it doesn't sell now, so what? It sits on the shelves and, and it'll be there and some, but someday somebody will buy it. You know, I don't know. It seems like all well, brands go through that. And if you sold it to the, to the distributor, you, yeah, who cares? Made your money. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's funny too, because going back to your story, Kenny, right? Going to Liquor Barn back in 14, not only was it 
130, 150, but it was source too, right? And that was unheard of back then. You're like, I'm going to pay how much for a source product? And then everyone, you know, the next batch come out is a little bit more and everyone's like, what? Sourced and, they, and unaged. Un, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they kind of yeah. set the precedent though, because once once the market accepted, it was like, all right. And then the floodgates open, and now that's all you see. And they kind of, granted, they also had a product that backed up the flavor profile. Looking back, you know, I wish I bought even more bottles than I did, but yeah, um, they were really, you know, a game changer in that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we all put Kentucky Out Rye, the batch one, as one of our favorites that year. I, I mean, it was. Oh, gosh, yeah. it really ranked up there for a lot oh, of us. So good. And, and you know, there's other thing that came to mind. Ryan, you had mentioned the uh, the Kentucky Owl. What was their their mass market product? Uh, confiscated. Confiscated. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when I think about it, I guess that was their their play to try to be a little bit more mass market. It wasn't supposed to be the the big elevated, you know, Kentucky Owl, you know, bourbon release, whatever it is. But even in that, at the, I mean, they, gosh, I, I think we could go to Costco today, and you can still see they're still trying to take down prices. So. I think that I don't know if that plays into, again, uh, a market penetration strategy that just failed. I don't know if this is something that, you know, I, if you look at it, it, is that something that like, do you want that to be part of the legacy or not? And I know that the confiscated kind of flopped for a lot of people out there and it's still uh, an expensive product sourced unaged or you know, no age statement too. You know, it's kind of bound to happen though, right? So it went from a very niche, small batch product, one blender, and then you have a company buy them out and they're instantly talking about building a roller coaster in a theme park. And the video they put together, like the 3D generated video was insane. It looked like the Disneyland of bourbon, right? So the only way you do that though, is by pumping out a ton of product to the market to start paying for some of that. So it was, you know, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot more Kentucky Owl in the future and all sorts of varieties so that they can start getting the funding, whether or not the amusement park ever goes forward, but just to start supporting their investment. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that played part of what Dixon was thinking too. You definitely lose control over that. And you went from being somebody who has that final touch of control to, all right, now I need to pump out how many thousands and thousands and thousands of barrels in a given you know, yeah. year to make this a reality. Don't forget the pyramid-shaped warehouses. Oh yes, of course. Right. Dude, <laughs> what, I can't tell what, me even relatives. behind that. L- like, I can't tell you people in Bardstown were just like yeah. so pumped for that. You know, it's like we're gonna be something with that. <laughs> <laughs> we got pyramids. Here we go. That was it. He's leaving because he disagreed with the roller coaster designer, and just, that must you know, have been. Yeah, that was it. That yeah. was I think we, made, it, we took all this. We made, we got through it. That's why. <laughs> That's why I left. Yeah. And I th- also think this this also looks back at even the conversation we had last roundtable when we talked about the dance and that legacy and how Heaven Hill owns it now. And I don't know if if Dixon is 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 happy about it or if he's a little remorse about it because I understand that this was a, a brand and a, something that his family owned. He'll never own it again. His kids will never own it. His their descendants right. will never own it again. Yeah. And I think that's uh, that's a that's probably one of the probably the, the toughest pills to swallow uh, if I had to guess for him. But yeah, that happened back when he sold it to Stoli, and you know whatever fortune or I don't know that it's fortune, but whatever fortune he made off of it, you know that's that's the price. You know he he got he got it all, and hopefully now he can parlay that into something else. And even though it's not Kentucky Owl, it's the you know, it's it's Deadman whiskey or something like that. Double D, double D whiskey. Double D. There you go. <laughs> Marketing just <laughs> writes works. itself. <laughs> so we go ahead and register that one real quick. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I wonder too at the time, maybe this was, you know, this is all speculation because it's fun. But, uh, you know, when he they originally sold it, you know, it's like, well, gosh, the Beams, you know, sold theirs forever ago. The Maker, you know, the Samuels and the, the Russells, you know, they're part, not that they owned it, but they're part of, you know, <laughs> A lot of people, even though they sell, they're still part of the the brands for you know ages, and uh, you know maybe that was a thought too that yeah I'm selling this, but I'm going to be part of it, and this is going to be you know my bloodline forever. But I guess it just wasn't meant to be. Yeah, but I am excited for what Double D comes up with. Double D, I hope he's watching. We give him, we give everyone good ideas. On this, this is this. true. This is true. You should hire us as brain consultants. To, <laughs> we get into the conference room. They're like, "These are the dumbest ideas I've ever heard. Why are y'all here?" <laughs> and we give this out for free, people for free, people for free. Mister Dumas. <laughs> you know, as I say, we do this for free. We should really start charging at some point. Yeah, yeah. But it, I mean, <laughs> honestly, but we, 
Yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, pay for some AirPods for me. But we really do. We wish Dixon all the best. And I know this is it was as Ryan has probably put it in the best possible way earlier, saying that it's it's probably very tough, but it's probably the right move for him and his family and and what he wants to do. I know that the Beaumont Inn is his first love, and he's still there making biscuits and fried chicken all the time. So you know, keep pumping those out. And I know that we'll keep watching on Instagram, some of the, the shots he does for his, his tastings and everything like that too. So all the best Dixon, you know, going yep. forward. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. So we'll kind of move on to the next thing. And, and that's something that kind of caught my eye and, and actually a shout out to John Roder, uh, who, who sent this a little bit earlier. So we've seen a lot more legal designations for whiskey starting to really start coming about in the past few months, if you will. I think the the first one that ever kind of happened, and we talked about this way back on episode 169, was Empire Rye, saying that it had to be all grains that were sourced in New York, distilled in New York, bottled in New York, and that becomes Empire Rye. And a few months ago, we saw Japanese whiskey started wanting to have a better designation, saying that the spirit had to be fermented, distilled, and aged at a distillery in Japan, and must be bottled in Japan, and all this other kind of stuff. And the whole time I was like, wait a minute, I didn't know we could ship MGP over to Japan and just call it Japanese whiskey. But <laughs> hey, I guess maybe some people were doing it. Uh, but this is the one that kind of caught me. And and this was because uh, John Roeder, uh, shout out to him again, he works for the Indiana's Lieutenant Governor. And this is something that is currently either going through a bill or, or kind of getting passed into it. And this is a new designation for Indiana rye whiskey. And this is a, a legal definition, the same exact way you have a definition of bourbon, saying that it has to be manufactured in Indiana, produced with a mash bill that's at least 51% rye, distilled to not more than 160 proof, aged in new charred white oak barrels. I mean, we've all heard this story before. Placed at a barrel at no more than 125 proof, rested in a rickhouse for at least two years in Indiana, and bottled at no less than 80 proof or 40% alcohol by volume. Now, we all know that this is a good thing for for whiskey as the category as a whole because yes now we have some more guidelines we can say this is this is great we could probably do that we want more of this for all the finished products too like let's just keep pumping these things out in more classifications but i think the the biggest one's going to come about when we start thinking of what do we do with all this stuff from indiana that is out of the market are people going to continue saying oh it's just our rye whiskey or are they going to start labeling it and saying this is Indiana rye whiskey. I'm surprised Brandon. it's 51% rye. I thought it'd be 94% or higher. <laughs> <laughs> that would make sense. Pickle juice is an allowed additive, I've heard. Yes. <laughs> I think it would be interesting not? because Pine I think salt. that, you know, we it's while we get a lot more of these, it kind of waters them down a little bit because people start to lose track of what the actual categories mean. But some of them, I think it's good. And this, I could see people using it as, you know, a lot more people, it seems like, at least to me these days, are, are you know, transparent about where they get it from. So this is a good way to delineate without saying specifically, hey, we sourced MGP. You know, they say this is our Indiana rye and that kind of tells the whole story. Um, so I, I think it's good. I think it'll add, you know, some transparency, give some people some marketing credit and really highlight a whiskey that. Is still undervalued, um, in my opinion. You know, a lot of people who love rye whiskey now, it's because of MGP rye, uh, the 95.5, and that's opened up an entire class of drinkers. So, uh, yeah, I think it should get some credit. So that's good. You know, I think it's a, it's going to be a double edged sword too. I think it's great that there's more categories. I'm all from a category, like from a category perspective, from a whiskey perspective, I think it's awesome. I think it's also a double-edged sword for how you target consumers too, because then it only takes one person to have, we'll say an Empire Rye, right? They have a bottle of Empire Rye, they have one bad Empire Rye. I don't like Empire Rye, I'm never trying again. All of a sudden, instead of just saying, well, I'm gonna try this distillery from New York, oh, it's an Empire Rye, mm, I don't like Empire Rye. But it tastes, nope, okay, don't like Empire Rye. So you gotta be a little bit careful too, You know, when do you wanna use that designation? Is it on your main product or is it on more of like a specialty product? Because you might you might block out some of the consumer base that might go after you. Um, you know, the wine world has been you always face that too. And granted, there's more designations, much more stringent. But now that's kind of where we're coming from. Oh, I don't like Malbec. Okay, I'm not going to try this. Not going to try this wine region anymore. So it'll be really interesting to see how that impacts consumer mindset as we get more and more 
classifications out there being labeled that they have you know availability to choose from. I would be worried if like say I'm just thinking like if I were a Kentucky brand that's using MGP Rye, for example, like Bullet or something, do you have to say, you know, if this law passed, you have to say, well, no, this is Indiana Rye. Like, it not just say it's distilled in Indiana on the back, you know, tiny label, but you have to, like, say, no, this is our Indiana Rye from Bullet. You no, know, it's, it goes to me, back to the same thing. Like, of, it's, it's the same thing as, you know, sourcing from uh, Schmickle or anything else and knowing that you could say this is Tennessee whiskey or you can call it bourbon. You can call it whatever you want. So, it really comes down to the the bottler or the NDP or whoever so it's it not is. not saying you have to say that you don't have to. Right. Indiana you don't have to. It gives you it gives you an option. Yeah. So they're not gotcha. forcing the class on somebody. They're just they're saying. It's although the that option. would be the option. Would be the way to change a lot of this and, and bring some clarity is to to force these classes on the bottle. So if it is actually Kentucky bourbon, you have to put it on there. And if it's in it, Indiana bourbon. I know that's not a class, but if it's Indian or I, you have to put it on there. There'd be a little less, but then I guess you've got like the pursuit guys and barrel and others who are just sourcing from all different places. And it'd be like a paragraph to explain exactly what it is based <laughs> off of all the designations. So sorry. I take, take my point back. Yeah. I take, you want to go an empire label, label so you can read brand. the five. The five <laughs> yeah, it, it flips out and keeps yeah. uh, spreading out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, I guess the, the question kind of, uh, Brian, I'll, I'll let you go here, but I'll, I'll pose this to you too, is, yeah. um, you know, would you see people that are sourcing from Indiana actually put this on their label or they're going to be like, I don't want to put Indiana rye whiskey on my label. I, why would I want to do that? Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53 gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. You can find all spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. It's time to fling into spring at Total Wine and more, where fresh flavors are in full bloom and we're talking bubbly and brunch with Pinot on the porch. So no matter what's on your table, they have the wine and the savings to match. Bacon practically begs for Chardonnay. And which rosé are you feeling today? They surely have your shade. Brighten up your glass with a fresh bourbon cocktail. Mint julep or a Belmont jewel, anyone? And with over 8,000 wines, 4,000 spirits, and 2,500 beers to choose from, you can expect the unexpected. And always at low prices with the best service in America. So what will it be today? Choose curbside pickup or in-store pickup. You can explore more in the store or online at TotalWine.com. Heaven Hill Distillery has been lifting America's spirit since 1935. They celebrate American whiskey's rich traditions, guide its evolution, and champion its exciting future. For Heaven Hill, whiskey is more than a profession. It's a personal passion that is poured into every bottle, shared with newcomers and aficionados alike. So whether you enjoy the simple pleasure of Evan Williams' bottle and bond, or savor that uniquely satisfying experience of a rare single barrel bourbon like Elijah Craig 18-year-old, you'll find a home at Heaven Hill. If you want to learn more about the craft and techniques of making quality American whiskey, check out the educational resources and sign up for their newsletter at heavenhilldistillery.com. And Heaven Hill reminds you to think wisely and drink wisely. Cheers. Would you see people that are sourcing from Indiana actually put this on their label or they're going to be like, I don't want to put Indiana rye whiskey on my label. Why would I want to do that? And, and that's actually the same thing I was thinking. You know, you got, is Idaho going to pass something? And who who wants Idaho rye? I mean, are you <laughs> going to put that on the label? Um, probably not. And the the two states with all the cachet are Kentucky by a, a long ways and Tennessee um, with a real healthy name recognition too. Um, Empire rye might get there someday. A lot of people in 
the enthusiast anyways are familiar with the Indiana rye and we think of it as that 95.5, but but people are looking for Kentucky and Tennessee. And if they don't see Kentucky or Tennessee on the label, they're not going to get it. So I think it's risky for people to to go out and, and get new designations for their respective states and, and use it. I think it's they're shooting themselves in the foot. I mean, how many comments do you guys see too, or when you talk with folks, oh, it's not bourbon unless it comes from Kentucky. Right. Yeah. I don't oh, care yeah. what it's it says. Still, it's not from wind, Kentucky. Yep. It's not bourbon. You're like, oh man. All right. Yeah, the bourbon companies yep. here, they did a great job of <laughs> misinforming the public on that that one <laughs> i've heard it on a couple tours <laughs> yeah it's yeah a, don't be wrong i mean uh, even dr pat heist uh, i think in his ted talk he goes it can be bourbon can be made anywhere in the united states but if you want to drink kentucky. it if you want to drink it it's got to be made from kentucky so right no i i uh i agree and and blake to kind of go back to what you were saying at the very beginning too I think it would actually be beneficial to allow this to have a, a legal designation for any state in any category to be able to put it on there. And you would be able to, you know, say, you know, whatever Minnesota proud or whatever you want to put on the bottle or Minnesota whiskey. But at the end of the day, if you also try to penetrate other markets and you are from Minnesota and you want to get into Tennessee or Texas or Florida or wherever, that's probably going to hurt you. It's just one of those things that that most of the time you kind of just want to get rid of. Is, is you want to hide as much as that possible because you don't want people to have those, yeah, uh, those I mean, preconceived notions. Woodenville would tell you. I mean, they have a great product, but in Kentucky they've had a hard time just because it's Washington. Because you know when people try it, you know it's great, but that's hard to just say. Come get a bourbon from Washington. You know, it's like it just doesn't have the same appeal. What's the, uh, what's, is it the salsa commercial? <laughs> El, uh, yeah, Pace, yeah. Pace, or what was it? Yeah. yeah. New, New York, York City. City. New York, York City. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that, yeah. I mean, that is kind of how the market is with yeah. bourbon as well. I I think Woodenville is a good uh, example of that. I think they're making some of the best stuff out mm-hmm. there. Um, but, yep, yeah, for whatever reason, people see Washington and they think, Oh no, I can't. It, it's got to be young and and not very good, um, and and don't give it a shot. So, well, a lot of that too was when the bourbon, well, not bourbon, when the whiskey craft distillery movement really exploded. There wasn't a lot of good stuff, so a lot of people tried, you know, quote unquote craft stuff once. Maybe they went twice, and they're like, "All right, I've been fooled twice now. Nope, it's always going to be bad." And and they haven't gone back to it. And there are some really good quote unquote craft distilleries out there, you know, when they'll being one of them putting out some really good whiskey, yep. but it's hard to get people to go back for a third time and be like, okay, I'll try it one more time. Yeah. And I think that's just the, it's the natural progression of, of what we're going to see. And you're totally right. When the whiskey boom was really hitting a few years ago and a lot of craft was coming out, it was, it was crap. It was crafty crap <laughs> is what it, what really what it was. And Double C. I, we've been, we've been trying to really, you know, toot the horn and I, you know, off the, you know, hats off to Blake of being one of the people on the forefront of this and, you know, starting a business centered around finding really good craft whiskey to, to kind of show folks what it's all about, including a lot of us. And it, you know, I think we will see an overabundance of really, really good whiskey here in the next two to seven years as even more craft comes on, on age. And even the craft that we love today when that four year mark starts hitting a six or a seven or an eight year mark, it's there's just going to be so much good stuff out there that I hope, I really hope that we will see a change in market perception. Now you're never going to be able to take down the big guys. You're not going to be able to take them down a peg because they have, they have age and they've got legacy and they have heritage and plenty of stocks to kind of roll through. But it, we will see the ability for people to start branching out. I hopefully more in the next few years and at least we'll be here to kind of preach the gospel for it. Hopefully that's right. The good news. Good news is craft whiskey. It's not crap, <laughs> crap, crappy. <It's- laughs> not anymore. Not anymore. But I mean, I, you know, there's other thing I kind of want to take to on this subject too, is when we start looking at the, um, when we start thinking of the designations too, do you all think that there should be anything that's like different in here? Like there's nothing that screams, uniqueness like other than the fact that it's manufactured and bottled in indiana like everything else is just what we see in rules for regular whiskey and bourbon and rye production yeah can you all think of something that would be like unique or well that's why i I wish they would have done like the 95 five i mean right uh, you you know i think that's what all of us consider 
Indiana Rye anyways is that 95-5 mash bill. I get it. That's pretty limiting. and, and But it only favors MGP. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, favors because, MGP. I mean. Well, I'm sure there's, there's other doing 95. Yeah. Making it out there now. but There's a lot of distilleries in Indiana, too. We, like we don't that. give a lot of credit, but there's yeah. a lot of distilleries, too. So we need no, to. No, there is. But Or what if they did like an 80%? I, I'm kind of with Kenny there. I feel like it almost needs a little bit little something to make it more unique other than just hey it's it's distilled in in indiana i think um y- you know i think tennessee did a good job of marketing their charcoal filtering process and they've they've beat that one to death to explain why that's tennessee whiskey um and i feel like indiana is missing a little bit of that but y- you know i think indiana's trouble is is they don't they have so much corn and not you know, rye. I mean, they're getting their rye from other states. So to the extent that they are going to make a 95 rye, they're never going to get enough rye to make a 95 rye from Indiana. It's, I mean, it's all corn. So, but, but I'm with you, they should have come up with something to make it unique. Um, pick again, pickle juice, whatever. <laughs> it's like, you know, that should push distilleries too. If they want to do them, have a special designation come up with a unique way, right? There's the charcoal mellowing with Tennessee for Tennessee whiskeys. All right, you want to do something like that? Be creative, right? We don't have the answer right now, but think of something different that you can do and invent a new process and find something that makes it taste unique yet good and then go after it and label it and make that be the process. Uh, or or much harder. Really on the flavor whatsoever, but it's, it's a story you can tell. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's like saying that it has to be aged for at least two years, like in a concrete warehouse. It's like they copy. It's like us and Kenny copy and pasting contracts for our next contract. You know, it's like, you know, they're. It's what they did with the Kentucky. They're like, well, we'll just copy that and put I in on it. You know, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> so if you uh, work there, it should probably work over. We'll here highlight too. all the KYs in the document. And we'll put I in and uh, yeah. so that's our <laughs> search, search and replace. replace. Yeah. Search and replace. Yeah. yeah gone down that road eric put a good point about texas bourbon i bet mm-hmm. there'll be another one they, they haven't officially designated that one yet have they they're pushing um, hard to get that rule made though but yeah i think that one that's one that deserves it as well um you know that they, they're pumping out there, there's a lot of good distilleries in texas and mm-hmm. um a lot of people are starting to figure out that tricky climate so that's that's an exciting one to watch for sure All right, so let's kind of uh, move on to the last subject for the evening, and that's talking about 10 million barrels are now aging in Kentucky. So this was a great article that came out last week by Steve Coombs talking about how in October, the Kentucky Distillers Association released a record number of whiskey barrels filled, which was 2.1 million, and the total barrels were in aging were 9.86 million. So we'll just go ahead and kind of skip. And that was back at the end of 2019. We'll skip a year. We, We know probably over 10 million now. And so with the U.S. US whiskey busts that were happening in the 1950s and 1970s, there was concern that there was so much liquid on hand that it would create a glut. So the question for you all is, would we sense a glut in the upcoming years, knowing that, A, we've got this many people pumping out this much whiskey just in Kentucky. We just got talking about craft and how many craft distilleries are pumping out. Pretty much every distillery is doing 24-7, 365. They are pumping out as much as possible as they they can. So what does the next, we'll say, what's your what's your magic eight ball look, look like for, uh, we'll say, 2032 right now? My magic eight ball is actually looking pretty good from a distillery standpoint because I think the international market is just huge still, and it's going to continue to grow. Now, the American market might, you know, our flavor profiles maybe – Rum becomes, I don't think we're going back to vodka anytime soon, but say gin, say gin becomes a super hot next thing, right? All of a sudden you're seeing gin and flavor gin and you got your cotton candy gin in the market. Everyone's going gaga for it, right? But I think if that's the case, then because international market is so booming and hungry for American whiskey, I I think they're going to be able to quickly turn and just pivot where they sell it to. And then we're just going to go back to importing any, any good whiskey back into the States like we used in the past. So, you know, I'm optimistic. Don't get me wrong. There's going to be a lot of whiskey if American um, preferences change, but I think it's not going to be as bad as the seventies when they're just, you know, dumping it or just letting it go to waste. There's markets for it now outside the U S. Yeah. And I think yeah. there's, you had also mentioned tariffs. I mean, we all know that that's going to be a, a big inhibitor to this. Hopefully that's going to get 
resolved here uh, in the next few months. But you know, even with the international market, I know there's been a lot of people that have talked about and uh, who actually put it here in the chat. I believe it was Jay. I mean, if China and India take a liking to bourbon, then we it's gone. Even, even even <laughs> yeah, even overnight. with today's production standards, there <laughs> will never be enough to satisfy global demand. So that is that is one big if uh, if that happens. Uh, there was well, another you part think of, of the population now in the U.S. versus the 60s, 70s. Hell, the population's got to be what 50 percent more, 60 percent more. You know, in the U.S. I don't know. I'm yeah. just thinking. Yeah, that's out a of fair it. point, Ryan. There's probably a hundred million uh, people more. I mean, granted, there's more options, but, you know, and Rare Bird made a great point, more la- morality laws, you know, it's not so, you know, drinking's more acceptable, you know, now than mm-hmm. ever. I mean, now the, the, the big thing to worry about is younger generations are, you know, not drinking as much and they're kind of leaning towards cannabis or other things. Um, but I, I don't know. I, 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 when I'm in Kentucky, I'm like, gosh, there's a lot of bourbon being made. And then but when I travel anywhere else, you know, the thirst for it, the knowledge for it is just people are so hungry and they're just getting into it. And it's like, and this is in major cities that have, you know, you talk about Dallas or Austin or down in Florida. I mean, huge population centers, you know, mass amount of people and people flocking there. And you're just like, good God, we're just starting to begin still. I think, you know, yeah. Yeah. I think that is a very good point where, um, you you know, even the population, but what I always point to is the majority of people who are coming to bourboner and seal box based on the analytics are, it's like 65 ish percent are under the age of 40. And so I I just, I don't think all of those people are going to wake up tomorrow and just decide like, Oh, nope. Now I'm on to tequila or vodka. I think they'll still have that. So I think you have at least one more generation coming up that will still be into bourbon and whiskey and drinking bottles and and trying new brands. And then, you know, it may fade out, but I think we're still at like at least another 10 to 15 years of growth before we see something that starts to plane out or slow down or um, anything like that. So I think 10 million barrels is still, is still short. You know, what's interesting too, is that like with bourbon, I've noticed this that like, you know, with other spirits, like with beer or spirits or other wine, like people have their like go to brand that they go to, you know, and then and it seems like with bourbon, they have like many brands that go. With, so they're always buying multiple varieties of brands and trying different things, you know, whereas other spirits they are kind of focused in on like, you know, one thing. But I don't know. I always find that interesting. I think, you know, going back to Rare Bird's point, it's not only morality laws or, or views, no laws but views but the other thing is i think people are more open just to drinking spirits straight and trying new things not only just with whiskey but with everything i think that really plays into the fact that you know i'll buy an expensive bottle because you know let's be real if you if you're drinking bourbon and coke you're not gonna buy a 15 dollar bourbon right to, to mix with coke but if you're more open to drinking spirits and maybe you come from the tequila world or you like drinking gin straight or vodka sure it's just another spirit to try and drink straight and i think that actually has really strengthened over the last 10 years in particular, but for the last, you know, long time since the last bust. And um, I think it's going to continue to be that way, which, which bodes well for bourbon. And on that point, the cocktail culture has mm-hmm. taken off so mm-hmm. much and it's driven by bullet of, of all brands. And, you know, they continue just to sell obscene amounts of bourbon. And I think that'll help keep it strong. I mean, I, I was wrong, dead wrong, dead wrong five, six years ago when I thought we had already popped by now. So I'm done predicting. Um, I, hope, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I suspect that China and, and India will open up, um, but I'm done predicting. And if, if we have a glut here, then that means I get some well-aged bourbon on the cheap. Um, and it, it means we'll start thinking I'll about... Have plenty to, Kenny and I have plenty to sell you too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'll buy it on the cheap. And you know, people will start looking at Four Roses when they did their expansion and you want their their bourbon from before the expansion, same with wild Turkey. You don't want the new still, you want the old still and people start going that down that direction. So there will be an unending of s- supply of things for us to look for and talk about and get weird over. So it's, it's, it'll all be good. Well, and uh, if you think there's a 10 millions and there's going to be a glut, well, heaven Hills building 10 more 50,000 barrel, ha- barrel warehouses, yeah. you know, Woodford's doubling their capacity. Brown form is doubling theirs. You yeah. know, it's like, uh, they must know something, you know. Yeah, exactly. You don't just throw that yeah. kind of cash at uh, yeah. 
And Brandy, uh, she made a good point. Brandy Bowles, you know, I, I'm still too blown away by how many women are getting into it as well. My my wife, she can't stand bourbon, and but all her friends, every time they come over, they're like, "Can you make me an old fashioned? Can you do you know Manhattan?" And it's they, they they're loving it, you know, and they're becoming consumers now too. And that's a big growing of the segment of the market as well. For sure. And I also want to give a shout out to Jay because he did some some research for us. So there are about an extra 130 million people in the <laughs> U.S. Uh, from the 1970s compared to 2020. So thank you for grabbing that that census yeah. data. Yeah, and that exponential math in 10 years. So <laughs> True. And also shout out to Matt. Uh, great point on even having the internet nowadays. I mean, having the internet is just, it's super powerful. We have information at our fingertips. I can go to a website and I can order a, a bottle of craft whiskey and it'll show up here in, in another week. I mean, it's just one of those things that it's it's amazing. And, you know, we have a bunch of podcasters and bloggers that care about this stuff. And we put the information out there, which wasn't really there in the 70s. And you just went and bought Old Crow. That's, that's all you went yeah. and bought because you saw a magazine ad or a newspaper ad. So, oh, but if any of us had a 1970s bottle of Old Crow right now, we'd be shitting ourselves. <laughs> yeah, we'd be true, like, yeah. thank this you is so true. much. <laughs> yeah. Very true, very true. But I do want to give uh, one more shout out because there was uh, another comment that was posted on, on Steve's Facebook uh, from Larry Cass, another friend of the show who retired from Heaven Hill. And and he you know, said, well done on the article. And he says, I can't remember how many times when you heard Max referring to Max Shapira saying that if we can get one out of 100 if we get one out of 100 scotch drinkers internationally switched to bourbon we would have a major supply issue so it's uh it's a pretty interesting way to look at it um another thing i think that was in the article as, as well as said that if you look at just evan williams just the brand in itself if there was a one percent increase in the demand for it it means hundreds if not thousands of barrels that need to go into it that also could potentially take from other brands. So just a, a single digit increase is catastrophic or it makes a huge impact into whiskey planning and everything like that for forecasting for, for future. So that's why Elijah Craig dropped their age statement. You know, that's Evan right. Williams mm -hmm. grew faster than mm -hmm. they could ever thought. And uh, that's mm -hmm. uh, why they had to drop it. Exactly. So uh, as somebody just put on here in the chat, welcome to the new Roaring Twenties, fellas. Cheers to that. Yeah. Cheers. But this was awesome. This is a great episode. I think we, we covered a lot of great topics uh, and we we definitely gave some good opinions and hopefully we'll see what, what it looks like. And in 10 years, we'll still be sitting around here <laughs> once a month <laughs> bullshitting about dumb other internet topics on the bar on bourbon. So hopefully... Uh, <laughs> Double D will be the one capitalizing. You know, <laughs> That's we'll right. see if Blake Double Street D. still stands at that point. Yes. <laughs> 10 years right. in, I think I got it. I got another 10 years of round tables in me. <laughs> <laughs> done after do that, it. though. We, yeah, you're done after that. All right. <laughs> Mark it in the day. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put a reoccurring calendar invite and then just stop yeah, yeah. ten years from now. <laughs> stop in ten years. Blake, if you're still here. Like... <laughs> awesome. So uh, I want to let you guys give one more chance to give a shout out uh where people can find you and we'll just go in the order we did last time. So Brian, you're up first. All right. Thanks for having me on number fifty six. It's a fun one. Uh Brian with Sip and Corn. You can find me at sipandcorn.com and the socials at that name and bourbonjustice.com and i want to say happy derby week to everybody we we missed it in may of last year but we're we're back this year uh locals don't necessarily go to the derby so i won't be but i'm going to be there friday for the oaks and i'm going i brought out my uh some people will call it tater but my elmer t lee hat and this is the hat nice. that i'm going to be sporting for nice. the oaks nice love, love it, it man you gonna drink some lilies with that I'm going to drink some, not, well, maybe a couple lilies, but uh, I'm going to find those carts because there's one lady with a cart who has Willett Family Estate. She had Lion's Share and some other ones on her cart. They're all independent contractors. So the tip, the pro tip is to hunt down the bar carts. They've got the real good stuff. Ooh, nice. That's that is a good tip. Good tip. Yeah, it, Brian, but I also want to give, uh, so context for just our, our audio based listeners. So uh, this a describe your hat, but B, there's got to be a story behind where this hat came from. Oh, this this hat is just, I mean, it's a bad hat. I, it's it's what do you call these? A, a navy hat, right, or there's some like name golfer for it. Hat. I don't know. Yeah, there's I thought like it was a, a golfer hat too. Yeah, golfer hat. But Elmer T. Lee's name and his in his script signature is is uh, 
etched or stitched along the back. This is the hat that you see him in. When you see all of those pictures of, of Elmer, this is the hat he wore around. And I got this um, at the distillery when he was still around. So it's, you know, it's, it's cool to have. It's, it's not like he, I got it from him or anything, but it's something to remember the distillers who've left us. Driver's cap hat, says, but, uh, driver's, driver's cap, cap there you go, man. It looked like a, like a limo driver's hat or something. I had That's one right. that I wore backwards, but it said no fear on it whenever I was a kid. <laughs> 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 it said Kangle or it was like Kangle. Yeah, yeah. Kangle, yeah. yeah. LL Cool J. Similar, similar, yeah. Michael Jordan, yeah, all those people used to wear it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you what, we should, Thomas. We, should, we should tell Buffalo Trace to bring that one back uh, as, a, as yeah. a revival into the gift shop. That's a cool one. Here we go. Yeah. More, more free branding tips. There you go. I know, we're full of it. Ryan, we need to get you in a hat. Maybe you should just like start rocking a fedora, and like that's just like the United oh, Fedora. No. Maybe that's what it is. You got to figure out something. I can't do fedoras. I'm not Joey Fatone. <laughs> There's, there can only be one fedora per crew, and you're the person. No, not it. <laughs> All right, Jordan, go ahead. Uh, good show, guys. This is a really good show. So this is Jordan, one of the three guys from AppBreakingBourbon.com. You can find us on all the same socials, uh, latest release calendars, reviews, articles, etc. But really good show. Always, always a blast talking to you all, and always fun chatting with the audience at home. For sure, Blake, go ahead, wrap it up. Yeah, as always, Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox. Guys, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, I'm the the, the uh, jingles the jingle. coming soon um, for S E E L B A C H S. Um, but yeah, thanks again for having me. This was always fun. One of the highlights of the month is to come on this podcast, and I can't tell you how many people I get emailed or talked to, and it's like, oh, we we heard you on the podcast, and uh, um, so just thanks for putting on the platform. Really appreciate it. Well, as always, we're we're always happy to have everybody on here because there's a lot of a lot of very knowledgeable people a lot of good takes on here but again fellas thank you so much for joining and uh, dixon i hope we weren't too hard on you we love you buddy i know we're all going to do we know you're going to do great things so hopefully uh, we'll be able to see some of your secret projects coming out here in the future but with that i want to say thank you everybody for tuning in make sure you subscribe to bourbon pursuit wherever you get your podcast you can follow us on all the socials as well and with that, we will see you all next week. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.